Hi everyone, my name is Jesse Firestone. I'm the curatorial assistant at Wave Hill. I'm a white male uh, wearing a black mask. I've got a earring dangling from my left ear, some sort of like short, medium length brown hair and blue eyes. I'm really happy to introduce this program to you all. Uh, Queer Rewilding brings together exhibiting artist Zachary Logan, Bronx-based ecologist Christian Murphy, and Wave Hills Director of Arts for a conversation about local ecologies, queer identity, and ecological restoration. I can't think of a better way to close out Pride Month than with this program and having all of us here together. Before we begin, I wanna do an accessibility check, also go through a land acknowledgement and read some bios um, of our panelists. Today, we have a few options for participation. Uh, you're either joining through a link if you are using the Zoom link, you can use the chat function or the Q&A function. I've just typed in the chat right now. For those dialing in, if you want to ask a question, you can text 561-251-3171. We're not providing ASL interpretation today, but closed captions are an option. So if you see the CC button at the bottom of your toolbar, you can click that and that will enable live subtitles. Does anybody have any questions or is having trouble accessing the services described? I'm also going to type in some shortcuts that are provided by Zoom into the chat. One second. There we go. So before I read bios, I wanna go through our land acknowledgement. So we acknowledge the traditional ancestral unceded homelands of the Lenape, the Muncie, the Manhattan, the Canarsie, the Matinecock, the Shinnecock, and other indigenous nations. We respect that many indigenous people continue to live and work on this land and recognize their ongoing contributions to the region. We also acknowledge the enslaved Africans whose labor built and developed the Northeast during the colonial era and beyond. We also want to acknowledge the indigenous nations where Zachary is joining us from in Regina, Saskatchewan, situated on the territories of the Nehiawak, the Asinapec, the Dakota, the Lakota, and Nakota, and the homeland of the Metis Mechi Foundation. Before I read the bios, I want to screen a video from the general, the Consulate General of Canada, who are so grateful for their support, and I'll play a brief message right now. Hello, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. I'm Howard Nassim. One second. Hello, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. I'm Howard Nassim, Canada's Acting Consul General here in New York. And I'm honored to join our friends at Wave Hill to support this wonderful exhibit, The Shadow of the Sun, by Ross Blechner and Zachary Logan. This exhibit resonated for us as it chronicles the relationship between two artists who have created collaborative works while living in different countries, Canada and the US. I often say that artists are our greatest ambassadors as they tell a much more vivid story than I ever could. I don't have to tell you how much cultural institutions have suffered this year. And while we've continued to support them virtually, we're keen to experience them live. So we couldn't be more thrilled that this exhibit can be viewed in person at the magnificent Wave Hill. I wish everyone the best as we emerge from this challenging year. Keep safe. Thank you. Merci. And so before I turn this over to Gabriel, I wanna read some bios of our panelists. Christian Murphy is an ecologist passionate about preserving and restoring the natural world. He earned a BA in environmental studies from CUNY Hunter College. After graduating, he spent a season training as a conservation crew apprentice with the Bronx River Alliance before spending another season in Western Colorado performing ecological research on rare and sensitive de desert species for the Bureau of Land Management. Christian returned to the Bronx River Alliance in his current role as ecology coordinator in 2019. Zachary Logan has developed a studio practice focused on drawing, painting, ceramics, and installation. His work has been exhibited in group and solo exhibitions in the Americas, Europe, and India. 
His work can be found in public and private collections worldwide, including the National Gallery of Canada, Reme Modern, Art Gallery of Toronto, and Leslie Lohman Museum in New York, among many others. He participated in Wave Hill's Winter Workspace program in 2016. I'm so happy to be here and excited to pass this off to Gabriel de Guzman, our Director of Arts. Thank you, Jesse, um, Christian, and Zachary. Welcome, happy Pride Month. Um, we're so happy to have you both here. Thank you for participating in this conversation on rewilding with us. Um, I would like to start by asking each of you to tell us what rewilding means to you um, and how you incorporate, um, how your work incorporates the ideas of rewilding, because I think you both are com coming from, um, or coming at this idea of rewilding from different perspectives, but there's also some overlap there. Um, so I would like to start with Christian first and then, um, and then go to Zachary. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, there, we have some images to, to sh uh, show you. Hold on a second. Okay. Can you all see that? Um, Great, so I think, Christian, if you could um, introduce yourself and tell us uh, more about your work and the Bronx River Alliance. Yeah, so my name is Christian Murphy, my pronouns he, him. Um, I am the ecology coordinator for the Bronx River Alliance. Um, and so a lot of what I do is coordinate volunteers who actually go out and perform a lot of our uh, programming on the river um, from picking up litter, um, to actually removing invasive species and planting native trees um, and plants and actually um, performing water quality tests. So that's basically like a doctor's checkup for the river. Um, if there's chemicals in the water, how our oxygen levels are looking, and these have you know, huge impacts for the species that live in the water. Um, the Bronx River Alliance's mission is to protect and restore the Bronx River. Um, as you can see in this image here, we've got uh, an image from the 1940s on the left, which shows um, this is the West Farms Rapids in the center of the Bronx. Um, these are dilapidated um, industrial facilities that are definitely leaking pollution um, into the river. And on the right, this was taken by me last August. Same location, as you can see, it's been reclaimed in part by um, what I'm gonna call the natural landscape. Um, thanks in part to our work at the Bronx River Alliance and to the Parks Department. Um, you know, it's, it's um, once you open up a space to um, these species, you know, you start planting trees, they start producing seeds. Um, you kind of get this wonderful chain reaction where after a certain point, the landscape does start to sort of take care of itself a little bit. Um, it always needs a little bit of tender love and care. But, um, you know, once we clear away the rubble, once we get the clean topsoil put in place, um, which took a lot of work from the Bronx River Restoration Group back in the 70s, um, you know, we're starting to get more and more images like this um, across the Bronx where we're seeing these beautiful green spaces sort of reclaim what used to be eyesores, you know, really ugly places um, across our city. Um, so to me, rewilding really means um, reintegrating um, the natural system, the ecosystem, um, the interfaces between um, the different spheres of the earth um, into the place that we call home, so our cities. Um, and for a long time, I think we thought that we had to sort of conquer nature in order to survive as a species, that, you know, we needed to extract all of our resources and um, make places as safe as possible, make our food grow as fast as possible and at any cost. Um, so to me, rewilding is learning how to accomplish those things, right? Because we still want to survive as a species, um, but not at the expense of, you know, the life forms that were here for millions of years before we ever existed. Um, and so how do we, you know, accomplish this harmony? How do we, how do we give back? You know, it's not even just about like living alongside, but how do we give back to nature? What can we do um, to help these ecosystems thrive in the same way that they provide all of these services for us? Um, this is another great example. This picture right here, this is Soundview Park at the very bottom of the Bronx River. Um, the little tower that you can see in the distance right in the middle, that's LaGuardia Airport. That's the control tower at LaGuardia Airport. And so this entire part of the, um, of the city really was very industrial for a long time. Um, this was a degraded landscape um, and it's on the shoreline. And so when hurricanes would come, 
there's actually quite a lot of destruction that would happen to the um, neighborhoods directly behind where I was standing um, when I took this picture. Um, and so not only did we restore this habitat, bring back our native wetland species, which was good for fish, good for birds, good for a lot of different creatures, um, but at the same time, this habitat protects the Bronx. It actually acts as a buffer against um, wave energy and wind energy by um, blocking a lot of uh, the waves that come and, um, and uh, blocking that wind with those trees in the forest. And so it actually keeps the residents um, more safe. It makes them more resilient. And this is a sort of give and, give and take, right? So we've given it back to the landscape and the landscape is protecting us at the same time. Uh, and then this is exactly, you know, some of the things that we engage our volunteers with. This is what we continue to do to our environment. You know, we use our single-use plastics and our single-use styrofoam, um, and we don't really think about what happens to these things. And so this is one of the things that we're trying to encourage students and volunteers and community members to be more mindful of, is just because something leaves your hand and leaves your line of sight doesn't mean it stops existing. It goes somewhere, right? It's going to go into our rivers. It's going to go into our oceans. Um, and this is what it looks like. You know, it, it stifles, it chokes, it strangles, um, it poisons. Uh, and this is what we fight. This is probably the biggest thing that we fight against is floatable um, waste in the Bronx. Um, and so again, rewilding could look like different things, right? Not using um, these harmful materials, recycling more, using things that are biodegradable. Um, you know, this is another way that we can help um, our ecosystems. So this is a trash boom. This is um, one of our sort of protection measures, if you will, to try to catch a lot of the stuff coming downstream before it enters the marine environment. Um, so this is still a freshwater section of the river. This prevents it from um, getting down to the ocean. And this is actually Earth Day of 2021. Um, so this is our first event post COVID, well, semi post COVID, where we are actually able to meet with volunteers in person. Um, and so this is a great sort of reintroduction to who we are, who the Bronx River is as an entity in the ecosystem. Um, and it got people out, they felt great. We completely cleaned out the boom, as you can see, it was spotless, which just, it's amazing to just see that transformation. Um, I wish we could do it to the entire landscape, but we can't work on that scale. <laughs> um, and then this is just some of the work that we do. This is our conservation crew on the left. They do a lot of the heavy lifting. They do a lot of the industrial waste removal. So. Um, car parts, car tires, um, speakers and refrigerators and other odd objects, as well as um, fallen trees um, and tree limbs. And then this is me on the right, uh, measuring water quality with a um, sond, a multi-parameter sond. So this measures a couple of different things like oxygen levels, temperature, the pH, salinity, um, and it gives a snapshot. It's like a checkup, like a doctor checkup for um, the rivers uh, water. Um, and this is just a shot of where our office location is. This is in the South Bronx in Starlight Park um, in the neighborhood of Hunts Point. Um, and what I wanna draw your attention to is, yes, it looks beautiful, um, and it is beautiful. It never used to look like this. But on the bottom right, which you can see that mud bank there uh, is totally unnatural. It's thick, black, and absolutely foul smelling. Um, and this is a result of decades of poor water quality creates what we call anoxic conditions at the bottom of the river. And so without oxygen, organic material that falls to the bottom breaks down anaerobically and releases methane, releases all these substances, and it creates this thick sludge that things can't grow inside of um, and is totally useless to the environment. Um, and so as much as the work that we do like is on the surface and it looks great, like we still have these chronic underlying issues in the Bronx. Um, and this is a tidal section of the river. So twice a day, this gets exposed and we can smell it. You know, everyone nearby can smell it. And so it's this constant reminder um, <laughs> of these like, chronic issues underneath that still haven't been addressed. And so we can't escape this. As, as pretty as the river looks on top, it smells. Um, and I think it's important that it does this, right? I think it's important that the tide exposes this, that people wanna have birthday parties along the river and this is what they're confronted with and what they have to put up with. Um, you know, I think we need to, to face this as people. And then again, yeah, this is us introducing children to rewilding the landscape. This is literally the act of rewilding. We're planting native trees. Um, it's one of, uh, one of our volunteers' favorite activities um, is to actually get out there and, and put trees in the ground. It just seems to speak to people on a very personal or even spiritual level at times. Um, this is me in, a, in part of a replanted forest in the Bronx. 
And this is us. Um, I just quickly talk about uh, our mode of transportation. Our recreation program is one of our most popular programs, but we also use canoes to actually get a lot of our work done um, just on a regular basis. And so we recognize that the Lenny Lenape um, who used this river, um, they called it the Aquahong, the river of high bluffs in pre-colonial times. They used the river for their life ways. They fished, they traveled, um, they did all kinds of things. And we still use this traditional mode of transportation to get our work done today. And so I love that this is a sort of homage to um, the culture and the people that really taught us how to live with the landscape, how to be a steward of the landscape, how to give back to the landscape. Um, we still, you know, we follow in their footsteps even today, hundreds and hundreds of years later. And I just think that's really powerful and fun. And again, this is another act of rewilding. This is literally planting um, a rain garden. So this is actually a feature of the landscape that absorbs excess stormwater um, with native plants. And so it provides food and habitat for pollinators, birds, and mammals. And it also protects us again by absorbing stormwater and preventing flooding and preventing pollution from running in places. So it's a very multifaceted, um, multifaceted approach to the work. There's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of things that we have to juggle and consider as we do this work. Um, there's a lot of challenges that we face, but we take it in stride. Um, we try to have a good time no matter what's happening. Um, and we try to get others as excited as we are about, you know, returning parts of this horrible concrete landscape to the earth that gave us so much to begin with. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Christian, for uh, sharing uh, your work with us uh, and the Bronx River Alliance's work. Um, I was wondering if you could, before we move on to Zachary, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, the, the process of rewilding at a place like uh, the Bronx River. Um, what, you know, maybe thinking about like the manpower, what kind of staff, um, does the Bronx River Alliance have and how many, how many volunteers do you work with? That kind of thing. Um, yeah, we have, I think our full staff is about 22. This includes seasonals, interns and full-time staff. Um, so at the very sort of on the front lines are our conservation crew. So they're always outside, they're always on the ground. They have eyes on the river. They know when there's an oil spill. Um, they know when there's a massive trash pileup. Um, and then we'll pull the staff in as need be, our education coordinator, recreation coordinator, outreach coordinator, me, the ecologist, and we all kind of, you know, we do different things to make a lot of work happen. So if it's pulling in a school group, pulling in university students, pulling in TD Bank or Bank of America or some other corporate group um, who needs to volunteer hours, um, we'll work with, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but it's hundreds of volunteers in a given year. Um, and uh, they do anything again from planting to, to um, waste removal. So it's, it's a huge effort. We're a smaller, and we're a pretty small organization, but um, we could have have tendrils out across the Bronx. We pull resources here and there to get our work done. Yeah, it sounds like you do a lot with, uh, with a small staff, and, uh, but it's great that you're able to enlist all these volunteers. Um, I, was, I was wondering a little bit about the, uh, the research process. So in terms of uh, thinking about rewilding, it's a way of reintroducing uh, native plants and wildlife back into uh, the ecology. How do you know what, um, what plants and, and wildlife was there before? What is, how do you learn about that history? That's a really good question. So we work with the Parks Department. We have a partnership with the New York City Parks Department. They keep a database of um, uh, the native species that were found in the landscape before we sort of flatten them all down and put concrete over them. Um, and I think they pull resources from other partners like the New York Botanical Garden, um, which is right nearby, the Bronx Zoo, um, and sort of probably universities nearby like Fordham University um, and other places which have um, old archives from botanists and, and ecologists of back in the day who would have been keeping track of these things over a couple hundred years. And so um, we get recommendations from them. We get recommendations from partner organizations um, about which species to plant where, so which species love water, which species want to be further up from the river where it's a little bit drier. 
Um, and so then we work with those recommendations. Thanks. And um, <clears throat> just one more question uh, before we go to Zachary. Um, what would you say is, is the sort of ultimate aim or mission of the Council of Alliance through the work that we do? Sorry, can you repeat that one question? Sorry, uh, what would you say is the ultimate sort of aim or mission of the Bronx River Alliance through the work that you do? Yeah, the aim of the Bronx River Alliance, the mission is to protect and restore the Bronx River so that it could be um, a healthy, ecological, recreational, educational, and economic resource um, for the Bronx. Um, so this, you know, it's, it's not just about the river, it's not just about the community, it's about both of them in tandem. Um, so we care about the fish, we care about the birds, we care about the flowers. We also care about the residents of the Bronx who um, may not know that this resource is here, who don't have access to healthy green spaces, um, who you know, are not like the residents of Upper Manhattan or Midtown or whatever, who have Central Park, um, which is one of the most well-known parks on the planet. Um, and it's not fair that you know, a lot of our communities don't have access to places that they can be proud of, that are healthy and clean for them to spend time with, with their families. And so part of our mission is to integrate our ecological restoration with actually uplifting um, the community to make it healthier. Thank you. Um, okay, so somebody put in the Q and A, um, what does it have to do with being queer? We're gonna get to that, I promise. Oh. <laughs> Um, but right now we're going to move on to Zachary Logan's work um, and then it'll start to make sense because Zachary is approaching um, the idea of rewilding from a, from a different perspective um, than Christian, than maybe Christian and other ecologists are doing. But, uh, but there, like I said, there are overlaps there. So we'll get to that in a minute. Um, okay. So. Zachary, uh, tell us about this work that's on the screen. Well, and my idea of queer wilding really just revolves around the idea that um, land is body, that there is no separation between um, ourselves and the land. We are one and the same. So, I mean, I think this, uh, this image of green man number two, uh, I think really reflects that, you know, quite plainly. Um, uh, often in my work, uh, I will re reference, um, uh, make reference to art history. Um, the other, the, the main catalyst for all of my work is, is my body. So regardless of whether or not my body is physically present or not, I am talking about my body in space and in and time and sort of reflecting on, on that idea of, um, you know, what, how my body is um, being reflected in the landscape and the work. So um, this work is, is in reference to, if you know, the 16th century painter Archimboldo, um, who is a fascinating, uh, fascinating person um, and, and, and made remarkable work. Um, and so this is a, a direct uh, reference nod to, um, to some of his portraits. He was a court painter of the Habsburgs in the 16th century. Um, and I've had um, uh, several wonderful opportunities to um, to, to study uh, works in, in many major collections, but one of the, one of the main collections um, was in Vienna um, and from the Kunsthistorische, uh, where many of Archimboldo's works are, because he was a court painter to the Habsburgs. Um, so I did an exhibition and a, and a project in Vienna many years ago um, called Wilderness Tips, which is in reference to a series of short stories by Margaret Atwood, um, but also to this, this idea of, uh, of queer rewilding of the body. Um, so, you know, a, a, as you see here, my body becomes an amalgam of, of uh, plant life. Um, I also have a series called The Wild Man, um, and that involves um, sort of animal textures and animal um, amalgams, which Archimbaldo did as well. Um, so that's that's sort of the reference point here um, in terms of how I uh, how I reimagine my own body. Also, 
the idea of the of the green man, the personage of the green man and the wild man, and also another um, Eastern European character that I um, recently discovered named Leshy, is that they are, um, for me, um, queerly centered as outsiders. They're these sort of um, creatures or beings or or humanoid, human-ish uh, beings that um, uh, that sort of exist outside of, of nature, but aren't outside of nature. They're, they're sort of, there's sort of this sort of in-between manifestation or liminal manifestation that for me um, makes them sort of queer characters or, or I'm reclaiming them as queer characters. And again, they, this is a silhouette of my own body. So it's, it's still involving my body entirely. And actually Leshy, we don't have an image of Leshy, but just, I'll, I'll just, he's a really interesting character or, or they are a really interesting character because um, they, are, uh, they are sort of a protector of the forest from humans. So they're even more, they sort of, the idea of Leshy pushes ecology even further in a, in a, in a, in a kind of way because the, the um, mythology behind this character is that if someone were to go into the forest and do something that they weren't supposed to do to, the, to a tree, for example, cut down a tree, Leshy would protect the tree from the human. So, um, but it isn't outside of the realm of the natural world. And that's another thing that, I, that in my work, I'm, I'm very conscious of this idea of the false dichotomy of natural versus unnatural. There's no such thing as unnatural. We are all part of the world. So thinking about the city as an unnatural place and getting back to nature is, is, is strange to me. It's, it, it makes no sense. Um, so that also comes out in, I think, in a lot of the work uh, and my, my intention. Um, and this, this piece, another, another uh, art historical reference, um, this, this drawing, which is titled Blood Cells After Mary Delaney. Mary Delaney is a, um, was a uh, 18th century uh, botanical artist. She, well, she did many things, but um, fascinating, brilliant woman. At the age of 72, she started making these remarkable paper mosaics, which really technically should be titled or should be called collages because she actually inserts portions of the actual plant that she's that she's creating in a lot of the cases. So technically they are they're collage, but they're remarkable. They 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 also contain hundreds if not thousands of pieces of cut paper that create this um, layered three-dimensional effect to each of the uh, botanical um, renderings. And, and to me, uh, you know, I discovered them just by chance at the British Museum in, in 2013, but everything just melted away in the museum. <laughs> and I was staring at this piece and it felt like a love poem to the, to the flower. Um, and it was a, it was a um, passion flower. And so passion flowers have all of those incredible, uh, you know, tendrils. And, and I couldn't tell whether or not it was a dried flower or something made out of paper. So it, it fooled me. And I, you know, I've worked with paper. So um, it was a really remarkable experience. But I, I went back to the um, gift shop, bought a book on Mary Delaney, and became even more obsessed with her. And in 2016, I got a great opportunity to come back to the British Museum and study her works in person. And they are, again, they're remarkable. And they, um, they're in incredible condition for being made out of paper. But I mean, she had to hand cut, hand dye um, everything. You know, there was no access to colored paper at that time. Um, so it was just remarkable for her to start with these uh, to, to start doing these works at the age of 72. So I'm, I'm thinking a lot about her body and my body and, and the physicality of these works when I'm making this new work. And actually at this point, I just have a small quote that I would like to read from a book called Green Light um, Toward an Art of Evolution. When we ignore the realms beyond consciousness, we ignore our connections to the larger community of living beings, most of which over immense spans of time have lived and died without once awakening. Plants are reminders of the structures that sustain consciousness. Plants are reminders of our forgotten selves. So in that sense, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to think about these plants, I guess, that these renderings that I'm doing um, as, as little bits of myself. A, a lot of the, the plant life um, that I depict goes from being um, observed from life to being sort of um, observed from memory. 
uh, to being in some cases completely made up, like made up out of my mind, out of a uh, sort of muscle memory of the plant that I've drawn many, many times over and over and over again. Um, and I tend to gravitate back to the same sort of plant. Um, you can, sorry, <laughs> skip ahead if you want. Um, this, this next piece also in reference to the pool series, so it sort of comes out of my, uh, my thinking and my original uh, narrative uh, and, and uh, sort of um, compositional elements that I have in the uh, pool series. Um, in this depiction, you actually, again, you start to see uh, the plant life um, sprouting um, in this drawing skeletal systems, human skeletal systems. So again, there's no, for me, there's just no uh, separation of land and body and, and plant and, and human or animal. Um, they're interrelated. So what we do to the land, we do to ourselves. And I, I guess that's kind of what I'm saying in these works. Um, and, and I push that, uh, you know, I push that even further in, or I'll push it in different directions. I guess this is physically inserted uh, within this piece is, is my own hair. Um, and so that also, that relates back to my interest in Victorian aesthetics and the, that idea of memento mori and the collection of, you know, the hair of a loved one uh, or family members. There are these incredible sculptural pieces that are massive and they're they're depictions of family trees and they're made out of the hair of each of the family member, but they're de depicting like full um, pictures of trees completely formed out of different people's hair. So, um, you know, I've, I've, <laughs> I've had comments about these works being, you know, quote, creepy, but for me, they're, um, they're not, they're they just sort of, uh, there's something melancholic about it, I suppose, but it, it really is just to say I was here in a way. Um, but again, also embedding myself um, as a feature of, of land. And Fountain, um, this is called Fountain One, which is also in the exhibition um, currently on at Wave Hill. And the genesis of this piece sort of comes out of my, um, out of several different things, but one of the main points is my thinking about um, my own place, um, where I live, where I uh, where I came from, where I continue to live, which is um, uh, Saskatchewan. So I currently live in Regina, um, but I'm from Saskatoon. Um, and yeah, you know, as a as a person of Scottish heritage on both sides, my my mother's family moved here in the 1940s from Scotland, and my father's a generation or two earlier, and and settled in in Ontario. But I've lived my entire life here, and you know, being a settler on the prairies, um, I can't separate myself from the history of this place and how it has been transformed by, uh, by settlers and by the uh, colonial Canadian and British uh, settlement of the land. And one of the, one of the main ways in which um, the Canadian government um, settled, quote, settled the land was to really it, it forever disrupt it by trying to eradicate the buffalo. Um, so there are these famous photographs of uh, buffalo bones piled, and they're just, it, it's astronomically high, and, um, and it's remarkably sad and horrific. And this, this fountain piece, every time I show it, there are more flowers. That's one of the features of the piece is that the, the, the piling of bones, sorry, the piling of flowers is sort of a, a reference to that piling of bones, but it's also a passage of time. So it's a sort of a commemoration, a, you know, a, a continual thinking on that process um, and, and, and related to a couple of other uh, sort of monuments that I've seen um, in, other, um, in other times and other places and, and thinking about how when we, each time we come to a monument, we change that monument and the monument changes us. So that's sort of what this, this piece is about. But, you know, primarily it really is that thinking about how, um, how that transformation of the land. And it wasn't, you know, it, it was the removal, almost extinction of the buffalo, but the buffalo it's, 
itself was a really important feature, not just for, I mean, it, it, it sustained the indigenous populations in the, in the region, but it also actually um, was really integral to the, to the grasslands. It aerated the land, they aerated the land. So they were really important to, um, to the ecology of um, Saskatchewan and the, and the region that Saskatchewan is in. Um, so, it, just, you know, just that sort of decimation of the, of the land and people come to, you can skip to the next, I think um, it might be what I'm sort of leading it to. Oh, no. <laughs> um, so this is a, the other uh, ceramic sculpture. Um, but again, you know, re relating that idea of land and body and the, and the sort of the, um, the penis that's sort of um, ejaculating flowers, a bouquet of flowers. So um, it's sort of an expression of, of, of joy in a slightly different way, um, but completely related. Um, and then this, this, uh, this work, which is, uh, was in the first iteration of Shadow of the Sun, um, but not, uh, not in the current showing at Wave Hill, um, which is called the Eunuch Tapest, from the Eunuch Tapestry series. Um, and so again, going back to art historical um, reference points, um, this came out of a lot of research of the unicorn tapestries, which are in the cloisters. So I've been very fortunate enough to, to be able to spend quite a bit of time um, looking at them on different residencies and, and researching and thinking about them. And I really wanted to um, integrate the, the sort of um, the, the, the narrative of the unicorn tapestries about this sort of hunt for this uh, creature, this elusive um, individual creature, um, but also to think about the space, the sort of the flattening of the mill floor um, patterned floral space that's rather flat, a medieval space that's rather flat with a more uh, deep sort of Baroque vacuum of space. So to create a sort of in-between space to talk about liminality on the prairies and to talk about uh, queer liminalities and where bodies, where queer bodies can exist on the prairies. Um, and the main feature of this sort of landscape of this space um, are the ditches that line the roads. Um, and they're really where all the sort of wildness is sort of contained or left to, left to be. Because really, you know, people come to Saskatchewan and they think, oh, it's this, it's this wide open space that's untouched. Well, it's, it's, it's completely manufactured for human consumption. And the sort of wildness, any of the, those, those um, plants that, that sort of survive pesticides and other things, they thrive sort of on the margins. And so I've sort of, uh, as a visual metaphor, reclaimed that as a, as a sort of queer uh, space where thriving can, can exist and, um, and, and all these sort of different uh, idiosyncrasies of, of the ditch exist, but they sort of overlap with the intersectionality of, um, of queer life. So that's sort of what is going on in these, in these works. And then this, yeah, this is a, a much more recent uh, from the series. I did it last year and it was, it was during the pandemic and there, globally there were really were no pride festivals. And I was sort of thinking about queer visibility and, and how isolated we are as queer people to begin with. And then to have this sort of, um, this, the festivities of this or, or, the, or even, you know, the, what ended up happening was a lot of protest, which, which is, was remarkable and so brilliant to see happening from afar. I mean, there wasn't, uh, there wasn't as much activity here in Regina, but there were, there, there were some, you know, there were some uh, protest marches and, and it was very profound to see all of that. So around the time of Pride, the month of Pride, I decided I wanted to basically recreate the newest Pride flag that had the, um, uh, that had the um, people of color and the um, trans, um, and also a reference to two spirit as well, because there's a, I don't know if you can see it, but in the middle, there's a, um, there's a flowering of, um, of two, yes, yeah, um, two feathers, which is sort of a representation of two spirit peoples. So it sort of manifested the pride flag, I guess, uh, as, a, as a ditch sort of that, as a representation of that sort of thriving. Um, and weeds are really central to my thinking um, about this because there's an overlap in which we, which we talk about weeds and we talk about um, ourselves socially. So why is a weed a weed? Well, it's deemed a weed because it has no, um, no human 
uh, purpose for consumption, but we still have a real reason and purpose for thriving. Um, and that's often also how we talk about um, sexualities uh, and, and other things socially um, as humans. So I, I, I often will, um, will use ditch flowers and quote weeds. And, and I also love when people talk about, when humans talk about invasive species, I find it very ironic. So, um, so that's sort of the, uh, the genesis of this work. Um. We, we do have a couple of questions that came up in the chat. Is that correct? Sure. Um, <clears throat> Linda Stillman wanted to know who the quote, the quote that you read, whose uh, quote yeah. is that from again? Oh, sorry. I, it's from a book called Green Light Toward an Art of Evolution. I'm sorry, I thought I quoted him. It's George Gessert. It's a really, really wonderful book. George Gessert? Uh, George Gessert. Um, G-E-S-S-E-R-T, um, and it's MIT okay. Press. Thank you. And um, Matt, I um, <laughs> quoted him. Thank you. And Matt also wanted to know, do you have any recommendations for researching more about the green man? In oh, this Pennsylvania um, Dutch heritage, we also have more about the forest. Actually, hold on one second. I. I don't have, um, I unfortunately, do, wow. I unfortunately don't have a text on the, on the green man. Um, however, there, you can find a, there is a lot actually out there and I'm pretty sure there's a full text. However, I did find, this is like one of my, the holy grails of my, of my, um, library. It's called the wild man, medieval myth and symbolism. And it's, it's actually an exhibition that was on at the Met. Um, in 1980, um, and it just it composed all of these different uh, images and ideas about uh, about the wild man. Um, and the, I'm not sure about the green man in terms of different European cultures, but every European country has their own sort of version of the wild man. But there, I find that there are a lot of parallels between. Um, but the the green man, I think, is more of a um, a, a, a British um, manifestation, Celtic manifestation. Um, but th these works too, th these wild men um, are actually on display right now at the cloisters. I was so happy to see them. Um, they're in that, in that basement room right now. So you could go and see these little guys. Um, anyway. <laughs> That's great. Um, let's see. I thank you, Zachary, for sharing your work with us. Uh, I think those thank were you for great examples to kind of start thinking about um, this idea of rewilding, um, not only from a personal level, but also from a, a queer perspective. And I, I know I told you that I was gonna switch it around and talk about um, um, like looking at the decolonial perspective first and then the queer perspective, but I think I wanna talk about the queer perspective first because, uh, because of the questions uh, in the chat. Um, so yeah, I just kind of thinking about, um, I wanted to talk about this idea of rewilding uh, as a sort of queer act or queer concept, maybe thinking about our relationship to the land in a new way or sort of outside of uh, ways that we were used to, um, and sort of just like completely rethinking that relationship and, and what that has to do with or maybe thinking about exactly the way you're embodying the landscape in your artwork and thinking about how we're not separate from nature, but it's very much a part of us and we're a part of, of nature, that our bodies and um, plant and human and animal bodies are all sort of in her, in her. Um, So, yeah, who wants to? <laughs> Uh, maybe Zachary first, and then uh, and then I'd love to hear Kristen's perspective. Okay, I I'm really sorry, Gabriel, but I'm having a bit of trouble hearing you, so I only got like half of that. Uh... <laughs> oh, sorry. Is that there better? we go? There we go. Okay, I'm sorry about that. So I wanted to focus on the um, the discussion about thinking of um, rewilding as a queer act or concept. Um, 
and thinking about our relationship to to the land in a new way. Just like, how do we rethink that? And is that, um, is there something queer about that? Uh, and then specifically, Zachary, for you, the way that you are embodying the landscape in your work um, and thinking about how we as humans, as people are not separate from the land, that we're very much a part of it and nature is part of us and plants and humans and animals are all interrelated. Um, can you talk about that, Zachary? And then, uh, and then I'd love to hear Kristen's side of it too. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I'm trying to think of what else I could say. I mean, I, I um, in terms of, you know, how it's, I mean, it's, it, it's, I guess a, um, I mean, I've made some strange, uh, people often think of as strange uh, conscious decisions to, <laughs> to live, uh, uh, in, in living in Saskatchewan in particular ways. So, you know, my husband and I, we do have a car, but we rarely use it. And I've never had a license. I don't have a learner's. I've never done that behind a car. I don't know what it feels like. I, I simply take public transit or walk everywhere. And I think walking can be an act of resistance mm -hmm. when, you live in a, a province that is so um, car obsessed and they say, a lot of people say car dependent, but I think more car obsessed. And people like literally get in a car to walk up, you know, to, to go across the street when they could just walk. Um, and, you know, and I live in a, I live in a blisteringly cold winter, uh, you know, which is the vast majority of the year. Um, it also helps that I don't mind winter and I have a great coat, but you know, there's this like old Norwegian saying, there's no bad weather, just bad clothing. So, you know, pile on the clothing and go for a walk. Don't get in your car. Um, I mean, there obviously are times where we, where we have to drive, you know, like next week, we're going to go see um, Ned's parents for the first time in 10 months. So we're going to have to get in the car to go see them. They live in Alberta. Um, but I think even just, you know, like I walk as a practice to be mindful. I walk, and it helps me think about work that I'm doing. I walk and it gives me inspiration visually. Um, I walk and I clear my head. I also go to the gym and try to lift things that are almost so heavy that I can't lift them and it sort of cancels out my brain. And, how, <laughs> and it, so I don't know, I, I even think about going to the gym as, as a sort of, um, I mean, it's, a, it's an act of healthy, being healthy, but also a queer act. I don't know, I, I yeah, like I, I, I yeah. also, I mean, Reduce, reuse, recycle. Those are conversations that have been that started in the '60s, um, you know. And I have, and of course, they are important. But I also have my reservations about how much um, recycling becomes a um, capitalist tool. <laughs> and it's it's all it's as much about making money as it is about um, saving the planet. Just you know, what Christian was saying about about things, you know, discarding something. It's out of your it's out of your mind. So it no longer exists. I, I, that is something that, you know, it occurs to me every time I throw something out. I know that a million billion people are throwing something out of that very same moment. And all of that compiles and it, you know, so it, it, it can be incredibly overwhelming when you feel you don't have too much power to change that. But I find that walking and just, you know, going for a walk every day helps me to be mindful about the world. So green space is really important. Regina has a one remarkable, well, a couple of remarkable, nice features, but a really remarkable feature, which is Wascana Park, which is per capita, per capita, the largest um, park in North America, the largest public space in North America, um, which is, uh, is sort of strange, <laughs> strange to realize. I didn't know that when I uh, didn't live here, but it snakes through the entire city. It's a remarkable green space. Um, and, it, you know, when I worked at the university, um, I would walk, you know, it was a 45 minute walk uh, to the university from where I live downtown. Um, but it was a remarkable walk every morning. And so, yeah, so walking is a huge feature for me. And, and just, you know, getting over that idea that there is, there, that the cityscape isn't a natural space. That's nonsense. So, I don't know. That's yeah, I, I, sort of a start to an thanks. end. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you're, you're talking about this idea of um, queerness as, um, you know, 
this idea of queerness as an act of resistance and and and, uh, and even things like walking or just being present in the space uh, is both uh, queer and and an act of act of resistance. And I wonder if, um, if uh, Christian, if you feel that way too, or what what your thoughts are. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's it's kind of interesting to think about these parallels between what we've done to the environment and what we've done to us as a society, the Western society, um, as a as a queer person, a person of color who grew up in a Baptist household. I kind of feel like what I do now um, sort of feels anti-colonial um, because obviously it was white colonialism that erased a lot of people from North America, especially in the Northeast. Um, but it was also the same thing that brought with it, you know, these, these cities and urban centers and monoculture for agriculture and pesticides and erased, you know, biodiversity. Um, and so I feel like I was remembering our, on Earth Week this year, I did a, a little quick sort of half an hour long walk through the Bronx River Forest, which is in the middle of the Bronx. And I was just talking about all the invasive species which have come in. Um, they come in, they strangle and they suffocate the native wildflowers and, and trees that we have here. And in this sea of celandines, which are a plant from Europe, was one little Virginia um, uh, spring beauty just kind of poking up. Like everything else had kind of been like suffocated and was like withering. And there's one little native flower about this big, bright pink and white, just kind of poking up in this sea of, of invasive species. Um, and it just kind of felt like this little flower was rebelling against what we had done to the landscape. Um, and so I kind of I see this as sort of reclaiming um, sort of this, this oppression um, that, was, that was brought over from, you know, Europe and, and, and those sort of um, superior cultures and ideas that, that have sort of spread across the Western part of the, of the earth. Um, so I see, you know, returning the landscape to the way that the indigenous cultures um, would have known it and, um, you know, the different colors that used to exist across New York City. Um, we don't see a lot of these wildflowers anymore. We don't see a lot of these species that we used to have here from the birds and, and mammals and things are gone. You know, and when you, when you bring in these sort of um, oppressive ideas that erase um, people, they erase culture, they erase tradition, you know, it, it hurts the same way for me, um, just as a queer naturalist. Um, I do kind of feel myself when I, when I see, you know, a patch of native wildflowers that are like thriving and being successful and sort of being who they are amid like, you know, invasive species and, and garbage, it kind of feels rebellious. And I just kind of like that. Um, and I sort of feel like I'm doing my part to both help the ecosystem and sort of stick my finger up at <laughs> colonialism and capitalism and all these things that have, that have uh, tried to repress um, the way that this land would have looked. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can, can you all hear me better? I, I switched my, okay. Yeah. Okay. I, okay, good. Um, it was requested that I use my uh, headphones <laughs> instead. So, um, okay. So thanks, uh, Christian. Um, I wanted to, and you started to touch on it. Um, I wanted to kind of talk more about um, the idea of rewilding is coming from a decolonial perspective this sort of idea of restoring the land uh, and native species and, and native wildlife to what it might have been like before uh, European uh, colonialism and settlement. Um, uh, I guess I wanted to kind of think about rewilding because it sort of rewilding sort of implies humans kind of stepping back and letting, letting nature take over to a certain extent, if, if I'm understanding that correctly. Um, but in order to initiate that, humans need to get involved and, and play a role in getting that started. Um, and maybe the goal is that it would reestablish an ecosystem that can be self-sustaining without much human uh, interference after that. And, um, 
am I understanding that correctly? And, um, and uh, yeah, and, and sort of where does that line, I guess for you, Christian, as an ecologist, where does that, where is that line um, in terms of human uh, interaction and, and sort of nature letting, letting nature take its course? Sure. Um, well, you know, we could stop importing things. We could stop using fertilizer in our lawns. We could stop putting grass everywhere. We could, you know, but a lot of these things are already here. They're very deep rooted. Um, they are winning in a lot of places. A lot of this sort of um, single species, what we call monocultures. So knotweed, Japanese knotweed is one that comes to mind. That comes from Japan. It was accidentally introduced here through um I guess capitalism, the free market, <laughs> uh, it was an import. Um, and it's really, it's done very well here and it, it grows quickly, it has big leaves, it suffocates things. So even if we did sort of like a, yeah, let's you know stop doing things wrong. The problem is here. It needs active, active intervention, at least initially before we get this reestablishment of our um, you know, native species. Um, I kind of think about, you know, it's pride month and we've got pride flags everywhere. And it's like, yeah, you know, let's, let's accept queerness. Like, yes, it's, it's okay to be queer. Let's like dust our hands off. Thanks, you know, corporations, we've done our job. It's like, no, we've, we've still got Congress people who want to see people like me shot. Like we need active engagement, you know, to root out all of these issues. It's kind of the same thing. Like you can't just like step it, slap a sticker on it and, and call it a day. These things are still here. They're, they've been here for a long time. They need, people to be engaged, to be fighting, to be standing up, to be making noise, to be, you know, being radical, being a freak. Like these are things that sort of tell you like, no, we're still fighting. It's a fight. It's not like a, this like sort of happy fairy walk down, you know, beautiful pathway. No, this is the war path. Um, it's interesting that you bring uh, about, uh, you brought up the idea of being radical and, and, and fairies um, because one of the questions in the chat is um, from Kay Turner, who um, wanted to ask Zachary or Christian to discuss rewilding in relation to the radical fairy movement. Are you both um, um, familiar with that movement? And, and can you talk about <laughs> well, what is that? Yeah. I have, I mean, I, I, I don't know the full history of, um, of the uh, fairy movement. However, I did visit, uh, I did a residency in Tennessee in 2010, um, one of the best residencies I ever did. And it was, it was like a short, a short jaunt over to Short Mountain, um, where the Tennessee uh, fairy commune is, which I visited and they were um, really lovely. And they gave me a fairy name when you go, you, uh, you leave your uh, sort of regular society name behind and you're given a name. And I was obsessing over Queen Anne's lace that was growing everywhere. Like it, it's just such a, it's one of my favorite flowers. I love to draw it, I love to look at it. Anyway, so they, they named me, they gave me the name of Lacey because I wouldn't stop talking about Queen Anne's lace. So that's my, that's my fairy name. Um, but, <laughs> you know, I, I you know, the, 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 the whole concept, the idea of, you know, of just living, of, of buying a plot of land, living communally, um, farming sustainably, um, you know, helping each other out, um, you know, uh, socially, medically, all of those sort of ideas of communal living, uh, which are a foundation of, um, of sort of fairy commune life are incredibly appealing. Absolutely. And they, you know, they make great sense in terms of living um, sustainably. Um, and, and, and the idea, yeah, the idea of being, um, being given a different name and, have, and, and that having a resonance, um, being renamed after, uh, you know, a favorite flower even. There's something, there's something very powerful in that. <laughs> and, I, and I think that the, the, the act of doing that is a, is in a way of, of rewilding, <laughs> reminding you you're in a different, you're in the same place, but a different place. Thank, thank you. Yeah, that, thanks, Zachary. Um, how, how about you, Christian? I'm not as familiar with sort of the fairy sort of scene and renaming and this sort of communal space, but um, it came to me like I was just thinking about you're from Saskatoon. Yeah. 
there's a native tree that we have here that we usually call the service berry or the shad blow yeah, bush. Saskatoon berry. It's yeah. called Saskatoon. Like the original yeah. name was Saskatoon, but then, you know, white people came in and gave it these weird names. But yeah. it's like a beautiful tree. It grows wild. It's kind of hard to find in the city sometimes. They produce berries that you can eat. I was literally Tummy walking berry. around. Delicious. Like walking around, picking fruit off of trees. People looking at me like, what are you doing? <laughs> um, and I was like, this is food. Like, this is how we used to well, live the, here. The fact that you have the knowledge of what berries you can eat and what berries you can't. Most people go to a park and they have no idea what they can eat and what they can't. Just that knowledge. Well, you know, we used to look at, at, at these spaces. So the whole reason that Central Park exists is because Frederick Law Olmsted and, and his partner wanted a city park that would rival those of London and Paris. Right. Um, and so for a long time, these spaces were like, grandiose for the wealthy like horse and carriage would go down there like beautiful women in their gowns um and it was just like prim and proper sort of architecture green architecture really nothing to do with the ecosystem nothing to do with how we you know benefit with the landscape it was all literally manufactured for wealthy people to feel good about themselves so i feel like walking into the park and pulling berries off the tree to eat them is kind of like you know no this is not your playground this is part of the landscape that I'm living in and I'm enjoying and thriving yeah. and you know I'm advocating for this tree I'm advocating for the, the bird that eats the, the berries from the tree and the bee that pollinates the flowers that the tree produces so you know and I, I, I'm reminded that um, parks have been queer spaces for a long time parks have been protected cool shady safe spaces for queer people for decades um, and I, we're seeing a resurgence now in our city parks. I don't quite know why, um, but, you know, people using the parks in different ways. And I'm not, I, it's, you know, people are getting used to just kind of walking around the park in the evening and seeing people out and about doing what they're doing. And no one's really making too much of a stink about it, which I think is really interesting. I, you know, I, I like to take night walks with my friend Kira. Um, we go to Central Park, we talk about everything you know under the sun um and if you go into sort of the middle of the park where the ramble is um it has become a queer space it has been reclaimed as a queer space since the pandemic i want to say it's like this really like rebirth of the of the place which used to be you know where 40 20 bird watchers would go and be really snooty and tell people to be quiet because they're scaring the birds so you know there's like so many like fun parallels that i've seen in this just the past year alone that just they're rebellious acts and they feel good, you know, just to, just to see that. Yeah, I mean, the ecologies of, of um, you know, uh, queer spaces, queer bodies in, in parks is very, like a very long history. I mean, I didn't know this before, um, before I had done um, work on the Unic Tapestry series, but um, the uh, former director of the Leslie Lohman Museum, um, Hunter Ohanian, Wrote, an, uh, wrote the foreword for the catalog for um, the drawing, which was featured in their uh, Wooster Street window. And he talked about Fort Tryon Park and how Fort Tryon Park in the late 18th century was, you know, was where uh, queer men um, went to have sex. And, they, and I had no idea of that history. And so that, that was such an interesting overlap with, with the work I was doing and the, the use of the unicorn tapestries and their location up at the cloisters. Um, and those those areas are are sort of continually um, morphing and changing and growing and um, so it's great to hear uh, Central Park um, and it makes sense since uh, since the pandemic too I think people became more aware of their uh, public spaces uh, when they were stuck inside for so long just to be out um, outside and um, yeah. I think there's yeah. one other thing that I wanted to just address in terms of uh, yeah. Carrie Wilding um, from the perspective of, again, a settler living in Saskatchewan. Uh -huh. um, I think one of the things um, that settlers um, often don't acknowledge and aren't necessarily even aware of, which is, which is ridiculous, um, is the fact that we are all treaty people. So the treaties which were signed between indigenous people uh, you know, and, and the crown they've really never been lived up to ever. Um, mm -hmm. So one of those ways is to, uh, you know, uh, in a sense, be, um, be mindful and I think be, um, live into that is listening to indigenous communities. And, and right now that 
you know, the, this sort of Saskatchewan, for example, is getting world worldwide attention because of um, the discovery of, um, you know, a, a grave site of 751 uh, persons. Those grave sites have been known about in those communities for an incredibly long time. And it's either a point of, you know, the government's not listening or people not wanting to know about it in the region where they are. But <clears throat> those sorts of things, th th these, these um, quote discoveries, not discoveries, but these uh, making these things aware and um, to the people around them um, and sort of living into um, a change in, in uh, living with among First Nations people and living up to the treaties, I think is another really important. Um, and I think Christian, you were sort of talking about that um, a little earlier. You sort of had really addressed the same sort of thing. I just uh, wanted to mention it from a, from a um, perspective of someone living in Saskatchewan. Yeah, we, we do have a coworker, Roderick is, he's not Lenny Lenape, I think. Most Lenape people that survived the initial genocide were moved out to like Oklahoma. Um, right. He is Shinnecock and Powhatan. Um, oh yeah, exactly. Um, but he is indigenous, he's from the East Coast. He's just not from New York City originally, but he is our only link to some of the lifeways that were here um where people were buried where people you know came to do certain things in the landscape some of these features you can still see as like little scars in the land basically um but you know it's when he takes people out he's a recreation coordinator when he takes people out on the canoe you know there are parts of the river where you don't see buildings you can't really hear the highways and the railroads and you do kind of feel like you're back in like the 16th century bronx before you know, the pilgrims were here. And so he tries to get people, you know, to just like open their brain up that way and just be like, you're back. Like, you're not, but like, imagine you were back. Imagine this is what the city looked like. And doesn't that feel great? You know, mm -hmm. it's the only, it's like the one little connection that we have left. <laughs> and actually it just, it made me think of one other thing too. And, um, and, and it's a more sort of um, on the same sort of, thinking um, bit, a bit more sort of hopeful in terms of thinking about perhaps um, going back to a more uh, sustainable idea of what it is to live um, or how it is to live where you are. Um, there has been a successful reintroduction of, um, of Buffalo uh, to different uh, parts of uh, Saskatchewan. Um, there was a, a large chunk of land, um, I believe that was donated back from, um, I think, a settler community or, a, or a, a, I think it was farmland that was given back to become um, uh, grasslands. And there were, there have been buffalo reintroduced to that area, but also to an area called one, um, the Wanaskewin Heritage Park, which was a, uh, among other things, a buffalo jump, um, but it's, it's now a, um, a heritage site outside of uh, outside of Saskatoon, and there was recently, I think, in the past year, um, the first uh, set of buffalo that was born on the land for the first time back. So, I mean, those sorts of stories are uh, instances are are amazing, and I hope they just carry on and continue. Um, and that's, I think, part of celebrating that and being mindful of that is it's just it was so so exciting and um, yeah. Um, we have a we have a question in the in the uh, Q and A section. Um, so <clears throat> someone was pointing out that um, although the talk has been very interesting so far, it's uh, been mostly centered on masculine experiences, even though very variedly so. Um, can you reflect a bit more on notions of queer rewilding, queer ecology, et cetera, in relation to women, the feminine, feminism, femmes, et cetera? And is the exhibition, for instance, in any way inspired by butch photographer Casper's exhibition called Rewilding? Um, I don't know about yeah, Casper. Yeah, I don't either, no. Um, I mean, the only, I, the only thing I can sort of speak to in terms of, um, in terms of my own work and um, sort of female or, or feminist perspective is my use of, and again, it's, it's more in earlier work, but use of the, the male body um, 
uh, as sort of, sort of objectified, sort of a putting a queer or uh, gay male lens on the male body um, in which I, that, that, that work sort of led into the work that I'm doing that engages um, body as land. Um, but yeah, it, it's sort of, um, sort of centering the male body as a object of gaze um, the way the female body has sort of historically been uh, featured. Um, and also that the idea of thinking about the landscape, you know, from a, um, uh, or being mindful not to think of the landscape as a sort of um, a passive, um, you know, I think the enlightenment definitely, uh, enlightenment thinking about the landscape was that it was passive. It was like a female body, it was to be consumed. And so I, my attempt is to push back at that. Um, mm -hmm. um, and, and largely, I mean, I'm featuring my own body. So it's, it, it is a male body. Um, I am a queer cisgendered person. Um, so I am speaking to my own reality, but it do, certainly, do, it, certainly those ideas of, about, uh, you know, feminist representation um, and the male <clears throat> maleness as a as a anxious performance is definitely in the work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. I love the idea of sort of talking about the landscape's autonomy. So like we're trying not to exploit it. We're trying to let it be what it was supposed to be, what it used to be, um, which does have this strong sort of masculine, feminine sort of bend to it, which, That's as fine. you said, um, I also just say like loving flowers is gay. <laughs> <laughs> like when I tell people that I love flowers, that I take pictures of flowers, like, you know, I'm obsessed with flowers, I get different reactions from people um, because, yeah, like landscaping and a lot of that stuff can be masculine, but like loving the fine details yeah. has always been a feminine thing. People, you know, will look at you funny if you're a man who is obsessed with like planting too many flowers. It's like, why aren't you, you know, chopping firewood or doing something mm. that uses your muscles more? Um, I feel like the attention to beauty and to color um and biologists will tell you there's a biological reason for this but i wouldn't listen too closely to that um but that's always been sort of a female thing that female eyes are more perceptive to these things um and yeah. you know most of the people that i work with like our educator um you know, our director of environmental stewardship the executive director of the Bronx for reliance and a couple other people these are all women um, they actually dominate in this work a lot. And so even to this day, we still see, um, you know, a very strong female presence when it comes to the actual physical act of rewilding um, in our cities. Um, you know, the female person has always been the nurturer, you know, traditionally, at least from the colonial perspective, we see this as the nurturer, the mother, right? Um, so I, I, appreciate the attention being drawn to the fact that this was very masculine centered conversation. It's very easy to, to, to not be conscious of that. And I do appreciate, you know, have to take the time to, to deconstruct that a little bit. Yeah, I do too. And, and, and as, you know, one of the organizers of this program, I, I was aware of that, you know, you have three cisgender gay men on on this panel right now so um and and yeah and but it, it's you know it really is just like we're looking at one um one angle of, the, of the yeah of many one angle of many um uh, yeah and we're definitely aware of that but thank you for pointing that out um and it doesn't make it right or better or anything it's just you know one right. one point of view um and going back to what you were saying, Christian, about um, flowers um, being associated with women, I know in the Victorian era, um, women used flowers as uh, a secret code, like a secret language in a way, like they would send each other flowers or pictures of flowers as a way of like, you know, telling each other secrets um, that their husbands wouldn't know or that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, it's really interesting to think about it from that way. Um, yeah, I didn't uh, know that at all. That, that's very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, no, oftentimes, yeah. oftentimes my work, um, uh, even, it's even happened in front of me, um, where I'll be 
I'll be looking at my work and someone will talk about my work um, as though it was made by a female artist. So I find those sort of, I find those um, sort of cultural, um, yeah, the, 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 those ideas about gender very interesting. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> so so it's it's never far when you're when you're thinking about or working with plant life because I, I do I do think it's just by and large gendered. Yeah. Um, what do you, do you say? Ever... Oh, go ahead. I didn't. Yeah. What? <laughs> I was going to ask if you've ever had like a negative sort of confrontation or or response from someone who is questioning your occupying a space as a white cisgendered man. Um, not saying, you know, I'm not saying anything, but just have yeah. you ever encountered a sort of a negative experience? Uh, there? Not, not necessarily. I mean, in earlier works that are a lot, that are, are um, um, purely figuration, um, very, you know, based on um, classical imagery from, um, you know, 16th, 17th, 18th century painting, um, and their depictions of my, my own body, you know, frontal, nude, sometimes, uh, you know, in relation to Catholic imagery, sometimes in relation to um, sort of co colonial imagery from the French Revolution, and just sort of reworking that through a queer lens using my own body. Um, I have had some, you know, people either uncomfortable with nudity, which, you know, is common, um, or, you know, uncomfortable with male genitalia. I've been told that, you know, my, those imagery, that imagery was triggering. Um, there's not really much I can say to that or about that. Um, essentially, that's left up to the museum to decide what, uh, you know, what sort of disclaimer is, is placed. <laughs> um, but not, and I don't know if it was, it was necessarily my, my whiteness, but definitely my maleness. Mm. So, um, mm. yeah. And, and there, it wasn't really a conversation, it was just a comment. So it was like, this is, you know, how I feel about it. But we, it mm. didn't, we didn't go into it, you know, further. And, and fair enough, I mean, um, part of making work and putting it out there in the world for people to see is for them to have a genuine reaction, whatever, whatever that reaction is. Um, once you put something out there into the world, you have, you know, no control over what happens to it. Um, but yeah. Um, I wonder if I would love to take more questions from the audience, actually, who has a question um, for Zachary or uh, Christian or <clears throat> anybody, you can type it in the Q&A or you can type it in the chat. Um, And if not, I was wondering if um, uh, Zachary or Christian, if you have uh, a question for each other or any other questions you want to ask of each other. Yeah, it, Christian, do you want to, do, do you have <laughs> one? I have one, but I, I was, wasn't wanting to jump in. You can ask first. Okay, <laughs> my question is about your, um, your work um, as a photographer, your your practice as a photographer, and I was wondering if it how it relates to um, you know the good work that you do um, as an ecologist, and and is it a um, you know I I could see doing the work that you're doing being very um, physically hard, obviously, but also mentally taxing to see what you see and experience what you experience, you know daily. I mean, it, the, the, the images of the clean river are sort it's sort of like a, oh, like a, that must feel great, but there also must maybe days where that you don't feel so great, but I'm just wondering if the, if how the photography works in, in relation to um, that aspect of your work, is it, is it about, you know, um, taking simply beautiful images or, you know, even do you take images of you know, garbage mixed in with, you know, is it, is it purely aesthetic? Is it, yeah, basically it's just the location of your photo photographic practice. Uh, good questions. <laughs> um, for anybody that doesn't know, I started doing wildlife photography during the pandemic as a fun little hobby and it's kind of consuming a lot of my time. 
Um, <laughs> uh, it really was sort of a celebration of things that often get overlooked. Um, and so it was initially, and I bought a camera so I could take pictures of birds, which are a bit more flamboyant, but a lot of the pictures initially were like very small plants or small insects, all native um, to wherever it was that I was taking the picture from. And it was kind of like, well, you're going to get spotlighted now because people would normally step on you or you, you know, would mow you down if you were in the lawn or just kind of not even recognize that you were there. Um, so, you know, I've got pictures of very small beetles. I've got pictures of like very, very small butterflies and things that you can't really see unless you're focusing in. And instead of using photography as a way of zooming in on those features, of these beautiful things that um, we are just sort of conditioned to forget about. Um, and it's since grown and now it includes, you know, migratory birds, because those are always, you know, very dazzling and attract a lot of attention. Um, but it really is sort of a hyper focus on um, these beautiful things that we, we are ignoring um, and letting suffer in a lot of cases. But, you know, we, the organization, the Bronx River Alliance will post photos of the degraded landscape um, I don't always feel that I want to share those with people. I do kind of want to celebrate the aesthetic more. It's just kind of my personal bend. Yeah. Um, but I definitely have lots of pictures that I do take um, that I keep away from people um, that are unpleasant to look at. Um, I remember we were out working in the river one day and um, this just shows you what happens to a river when you, when you constrict it and, and harm it. Um, the Bronx River is what we call a flashy system. And so it normally is at the sort of base level um, elevation, but during shockingly, you know, rain that doesn't even seem like it's that heavy, the river can rise in elevation and flood really, really quickly. Uh, and so what you see sometimes are um, fishing lines tangled up in the trees that hang over the river, which is to someone who's not familiar with that really bizarre because kind of like, oh, someone threw the fishing line up there. It's like, no, it could actually wash up into the tree branches. Um, and there was a robin dangling from the fishing line. Um, you know, we didn't get to it in time. It had been dead for a couple of days, but just kind of there, like very, very open, you know, very obvious where the location was. Um, anybody could have seen it. It was almost like it was placed there um, like a piece of art, just kind of hanging from the tree. And we all just kind of stopped and looked at it. Like we were, you know, joking around having a conversation, being jovial as we did our work. And it just like killed the mood. Um, and that's important. It's not always what I want to draw attention to, but it's, it's really important um, that we talk about these things that are happening um, to the landscape and that we don't do enough work to, um, to mitigate. Thanks. Um, thank you. Um, there's, there are a couple more questions in the chat um, or in the Q&A. Um, this one, the first one is for Christian. Do you know of any parallel organizations doing work uh, like the Bronx River Alliance, I guess, in the Bronx, in the, in Brooklyn, <laughs> in Brooklyn? Yeah, um, we work with um, the Billion Oyster Project, which is restoring oysters to New York City. Oysters, um, New York City used to be the oyster capital of planet Earth. We had the world's biggest oysters. We also had the most numerous and largest oyster reefs um, on Earth for a long time. Um, and then we wipe them out. So that's what the Billion Oyster Project is working on restoring. Um, there's the Gowanus Canal Conservancy. Um, and so the Gowanus Canal is a super fun site in Brooklyn. Um, it's like a toxic sludge bath, but they're doing so much work to beautify that area. And it's incredible. Um, they're a really cool organization if you don't know them. Um, there's state parks actually. So Shirley Chisholm State Park, mm. uh, Marsha P. Johnson State Park. You know, these are callbacks to uh, people of color and queer people from our history, but there are also mm -hmm. these spaces that are doing a lot to um, reclaim the landscape for, you know, our native species. And so, yeah, there's, there's, I could probably name more. I can't think of all of them right now, but there's a lot in Brooklyn. <laughs> Quick Thank Google search. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Christian. Um, um, uh, another question is, um, speaking of photography, the masculine and the feminine, do you find gender expression plays a part in what people take pictures of? Do you find a photographer's own philosophy and relationship with nature changes what people take pictures of? Should I answer that? Yeah, I think that's probably directed at you. I would say yes. Um, if 
you know, I'm so I'm following a lot of photographers, local photographers mm-hmm. on Instagram. That's where I post my work. And I have noticed that the male photographers are really obsessed with like um, really crisp, perfectly sharp, like National Geographic, like front cover style pictures, um, you know, bright colors, kind of like, wow, look at me. And I'm following quite a few female photographers who it's just like night and day. They talk about how gentle like a bird might look or how it makes them feel to see one as they're walking through the park. And they might not even be like a flashy bird. It might be like, you know, a more common species of sparrow, for example, which has muted colors, but they'll capture the bird, you know, doing something just kind of trivial, like preening its feathers or just like, I don't know, just sitting there. And the way that they talk about it in the caption of the photograph is just, it's so personal. It gives the bird this sort of persona, like it's its own being just trying to live its life. And it doesn't really care whether or not it's beautiful, whether or not people want to take a picture of it. Um, It's really like, yeah, the male photographers seem to want to do like this kind of shock and awe thing. And, And I find that other photographers are not so interested in that. They'd rather just capture something because of what it is. Um, and I, I've, I've sort of realized that and I'm aware of it in my own work. Sometimes I'm like, oh, this isn't like a pretty enough picture or whatever. Maybe I shouldn't post this because people won't be as impressed. But so, like, I took the picture because I care about what the subject is. Like, you know, like I liked what I saw and I took the picture. So I'm just going to share it. I don't care if you think it's ugly or if you think, you know, the picture's poor quality because I love what I took a picture and I want to share with you that this creature exists here and I want you to love it as much as I do. So yeah, there is a weird duality there, dichotomy. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, this question is for Zachary. Um, So from your own question to Christian, what about you, Zachary? Do you ever represent degraded landscapes or less ideal? Uh, less idealized forms in nature? Um, my, my work is usually located more like my, the, what, what I do is I, I will often, and I don't talk, um, like sometimes I will, but I don't talk um, too much about my photographic source. But um, up until probably the last two or so years, I've worked primarily from photographs and I've, I've collected those photographs from all over the place. So for example, with the Eunuch Tapestry series, it, you know, thousands and thousands of photographs that I've taken um, in rural areas in Saskatchewan, but also in the in the cities. Um, and then also, you know, everywhere else that I've visited and spent time. Um, I'm, I'm not often, you know, I'm in a place, for example, like Barcelona or Paris, I don't tend to take pictures of monuments or, or, or mm. uh, buildings. I'm taking pictures of gardens and flowers and weeds and, and quiet areas. And, and they end up being sort of um, manifestations of memory. So that so the, the memory is sort of recorded through the photograph and it, it ends up in the drawing, but they're amalgams. They're, they're sort of mindscapes or dreamscapes. They're not, they're, they're combined um, fictively the way that a Dutch still life painter would bring together um, a bouquet of flowers in a composition. None of those flowers were blooming at the same time, so they're fic- So it's fictive, but it's sort of getting at a at a sort of maybe different sort of truth um, mm. about mortality and and um, a sort of inner um, view, I guess. So they're mindscapes. I don't know if that. I think that. Yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Um, but, but yeah, they're not necessarily not. They're idealized in a way because they're sort of in my uh, in my head, and they're they're a, a way of sort of rendering a queer space, um, but out of uh, sort of out of experience. And um, I, but I don't think I've ever yeah like drawn garbage in the landscape, um, mm. which would have a which would have a you know particular sort of location and sort of metaphoric meaning, but it sort of is not uh, it sort of misses or or isn't doesn't really speak to what I am um, thinking about I guess. Although you know some of the imagery I I mentioned in our uh, earlier discussion, some of the some of the photographs that are in this discussion, um, Christian, that you took, you know, one or two of those on a billboard in Times Square would be incredibly effective for people to see what they're, you know, what they're um, participating in. 
I agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's probably time to wrap up and, but I, I so I, as in a, in that end, um, I would like to read a couple of comments um, that were put in the Q and A that aren't aren't really questions, but um, so someone wrote um, in regard to organizations in Brooklyn. Um, Newtown Creek Alliance does amazing work in Brooklyn, um, so that's another organization. And then um, the same person said, uh, "This is not a question, but I want to say how proud I am and happy to have watched this discussion." Uh, so thank you for being you. Um, I've worked for years restoring habitats in Greenpoint and happy to see these efforts in the Bronx. I cultivate hundreds of um, pollinator plants in F-U-L-L-I -L -L at F-U-L-L-I -L -L NYC. So let's connect and keep the discussion going. So um, thank you for, for those comments. Um, and, oh, look, there's another question in the chat. Okay. Uh, maybe we'll read this one more question and then we'll and then we'll um, wrap it up. So I was wondering if you were familiar with the text "Wild Wild Things: The Disorder of Desire" by Jack Halberst Halberstam, um, Columbia University, who talks about the wild more psychoanalytically. The wild is not a place that we return to, but rather a place of bewilderment or as a place that is about unknowing, about losing oneself in the wild. Do you think that rewilding is only about returning to a previous state in the natural world, natural world or could it be about redefining humanness and what it is natural? Well, I wish that question earlier. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I know that's, sorry. I guess that was, that's quite a whopper to end on. Um, <laughs> I'm definitely getting, I'm, I'm definitely going to look into that book. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just say, yes, you know, I went for a hike. I went to Vermont for the first time in September of last year. Um, and sort of the South Vermont, um, Molly Stark State Park, places like that. And, you know, I forgot what it's like to walk into a place and just have your breath leave your body and just kind of your jaw drop open. You just kind of step back and look and you're just like, wow, this is planet Earth. Um, we have been talking about rewilding as returning to what we used to be in, but re I think rewilding could also be this sense of exploration, those like <laughs> jaw dropping moments of awe um, that I think you're getting at a little bit here from the natural world, um, which is a different conversation. But yes, I think there are multiple definitions for rewilding and I'd love to look at this one a little bit more. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And I would just sort of echo the same thing. So I won't repeat you, but... <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I feel like there are multiple ways of rewilding and, and you know, queer and or um, rewilding. Uh, I mean, I think, yeah, just being, um, going to um, a place that also feels um, rather untouched by um, human hands or human eyes is, is awing to me. Um, and I mean, that would get into a discussion about the other elephant in the room, which is, um, you know, population pressure <laughs> mm. and that we seem to be growing and growing and growing, um, mm. uh, you know, as a, um, as a species. Um, and I guess another point of queer rewilding for myself would be limiting my uh, carbon footprint by not reproducing. <laughs> um, but again, a, a totally an, another, uh, another discussion, but, um, but yeah, I think there are multiple ways of understanding rewilding, absolutely. Especially coming to self-discovery, that aspect of discovering who you are, discovering a new place. Yeah. Yeah, they could talk for hours about that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the purpose of this discussion was to really, you know, find ways of opening up the discussion, the, uh, the discussion understanding of what rewilding can be and our um, ways of rethinking and redefining what is natural as, as you wrote in the chat. So I think, yeah, it's absolutely um, part of it. Um, I think that's all we have time for. Um, uh, this was a really fascinating discussion. I wanna thank our speakers, Zachary Logan and Christian Murphy. Um, thank you so much for bringing your perspectives and um, your ideas and um, 
and your work, uh, sharing your work with us. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, I wanna thank the uh, arts department at Wave Hill, um, Eileen Jeng Lynch and Jesse Bandler, Star uh, Jesse Bandler Firestone for um, your help with uh, this program, but also with um, the exhibition and, um, and helping us um, sort of organize uh, the programming around it. Um, and last but not least, I wanna thank the audience. Um, thank you all for joining us. This has been really wonderful. Um, and I hope that you will um, join us for other programs in the, in the near future. I do wanna share um, a slide that shows what those programs are. So we do have um, virtual programs around the shadow of the sun that's coming up on July 13th, um, uh, July 15th and 16th is an art workshop that Zachary is leading um, that uh, you need to register for. So I encourage you to look that up um, and learn how to, um, to make art with Zachary. And then we'll have uh, an art in context uh, discussion with um, art critics uh, that will be discussing Zachary's work and Ross Blackner's work, who is the other artist in the show. That's on August 10th. So uh, thank you all again and um, have a wonderful day. Thanks so much. Thank you. Ciao. Uh